on session seven of Paths to Walk In. And we have been talking now seven weeks about God. And I don't know about you, but I don't even think that's enough. I, I, could, I could probably do a series from now until the cows come home. And for those that are not from Missouri, that's a long time. Just about understanding God, because until we really understand Him, other things can creep in to take us away from Him. We have discovered just in the last several weeks that when God began, when he, when he created heaven and earth, He revealed Himself as Elohim, the Creator, and all creation is answerable to Him. But the moment He began to deal with man, He revealed Himself as Yahweh Elohim. We discovered in the Tetragrammaton that Jesus is revealed, that the mercy of God is revealed in Yahweh, and the justice or the judgment of God is revealed in Elohim. I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed this. We've dealt with the fire of God, but this morning we're probably going to deal with the most important of all, the holiness of God. The holiness of God is, is so unique, and I don't know about you, but I don't hear it preached about a lot anymore. You know Why? Because most of our theology is based upon who Apollos is, and we just kind of wrap the name of Jesus around it. How I many know Apollos isn't holy? Neither is Zeus or Mithra or anybody else. But when you start dealing with the God of the Bible, you have to deal with holiness. I want to go this morning to Psalms chapter 97, starting with verse 9. And I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible, because the Amplified does such a good job with this. Psalms 97, 9 through 12. For you, Lord, are high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. You need to underline that one in your Bible. For you who love the Lord, hate evil. Let me ask you a question. If you ain't hating evil, are you loving the Lord? Hmm. That's a Selah moment there, isn't it? He preserves the lives of his saints, the children of God. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's going to deliver me. He's going to deliver me. That's a promise of God. Light is shown for the uncompromisingly righteous and strewn along their pathway. And the joy for the upright in heart, the, unre the unrepressible joy which comes from consciousness of his favor and protection, Rejoice in the Lord, you constantly or consistently righteous, upright and in right standing with God, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. That's a powerful phrase because there, there is a spiritual power of remembering. All the feasts of the Lord are to get us to remember. Why do we need to remember? Because we're prone to forget. It's so easy to get caught up in the things of life. We forget who God is, and when we forget who God is, that just makes the devil a lot bigger. But when you realize who God is, the devil always shrinks in size. We need to remember, but there's some, there's some specific things that happens. It causes us to give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. And maybe part of the reason why a lot of the body doesn't have the joy that they need to have is they can't remember his holiness because they have never been taught about the holiness of God. Now, yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? The only time we get excited is when we start talking about who we are. I mean, I've been in charismatic services. God's got an army that's marching through this land. That's me. Deliverance, you know, and we get all excited about that, and we sing about who I am, who I am, who, 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 who I am, and we think that's church. We forget it's who I am in him. That's right. And if you don't know who he is, you can never discover who you've become. That's, right. that's why we have a lot of Christians running around trying to find out who they are. The only reason they don't know who they are is they don't know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not going to find it out there in the world. You've got to find it in the Word. And here, here's a deep one for everybody. Are you ready? The Word of God does not start in Matthew. I, I know that, that there is a lot of debate, and this is really a, a, a thing, a point of contention with a lot of people, but it starts in Genesis. 
You better start learning about God because only when you discover who he is do you understand why he did for you what he did for you and who you have become and the price that he paid. Otherwise, it's impossible. Now, I want to look at the, the, the instruction that's given here because I think a lot of things are given in the Word of God in order so that when you do A, you can get to B, and when you get to B, you can get to C. How many know God loves us enough to do it that way? You know, the devil has to resort to algebra. God does simple mathematics. One, two, three, four. Helps get the devil out your door, okay? He does it very simple. The devil has to get it all complicated so that you don't see the poison that he's putting into it. Mary always did say that when we were trying to help get the kids through high school, that algebra was of the devil. I think she's right. It has to get really, really complicated for him to sneak in his stuff. But look at this. It says, we are instructed to love God. Now, that, that's a key phrase in, in the Hebrew. It's a, he, a key phrase in Hebraic thought because I have got to love the Lord my God with all my strength, with all my heart, with all my soul by keeping his commandments. That's how I demonstrate my love. But the psalmist doesn't even stop there. Not only do I got I to keep the commandments, but if I really love God, I've got to hate evil. I've got to hate iniquity. I've got to hate violation of his ways that are in the world. That makes the world look from looking beautiful to looking ugly. And that's exactly the way it needs to be because it's a siren song. It tries to lure us in. And if we forget how we're supposed to love God and what he says, this stuff can corrupt us and cause us to try to fall in love with it. But just like the sirens out of Greek mythology, it'll call you in to wreck you up. And how many know when God calls you in, it's to build you up. It's to fix you up. It's to free you up. But it goes on to say, if I, if I love God and I hate evil, it opens the door to something. Look at the sequence here. Okay. Love the Lord your God and hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. Who is he preserving the lives of? Those that love him and hate evil. It's in sequence. Get to step one, you can get to step two. And you never do step one, you're never going to get to step two. Very easy. But not only does God say, if you love me and you hate evil, if you allow me to get to the place where I can preserve your lives and deliver you from evil, then I can get to the place where I can start sowing light and joy in your path. Revelation of this word. You can never get to really revelation of this word and have an appreciation for this word until you start loving God and realize that this is God's special revelation to you. That God is so other, unless he wrote it down, you'd have never got it. You'd have known there was a God, and then you would have spent the rest of your life wondering in general revelation. God said, I am so different from this planet. I am so different from this world. I am so beyond that which you could ever imagine. I had to write it down for you. Because that shows his love to us. But then he goes, and, and, and look what, I, I love the way the Amplified says, joy is not from circumstances, but from God's protection and favor in the circumstances. We think if God, I'm going to get joy when everything goes right. Well, then you've got to wait till you get to heaven. Jesus said, while you're in this world, you will have tribulation. But what you discover is in the midst of the circumstances, his protection and his provision and his favor that gives you joy in the midst. You see, that joy is what enables you to walk on the water during the storm. That joy is what gets you on the other side of the valley of the shadow of death and gets you to the place where God can prepare a table before you and the devil's got to sit and watch. We need to redefine how joy comes. The world says when everything's just right, I've discovered everything isn't ever going to be right. And, and just with dealing with a husband and wife, how many of us guys have, have planned a romantic meal with our wife, and how many times has that went off without a hitch? It isn't going to happen. You can get the reservation at the best restaurant. You can put on your best suit, and I guarantee you ketchup and mustard or some sauce will find its way on it, and you will get the rudest, meanest waiter that you have ever had in your life, and the chef that night is going to burn everything that they cook. But see, if you're really in love, 
you find joy in the company. And that's what this is talking about here. In the midst of all this situation, because I love God, because he shows up, I'm protected, he's revealing himself, and I get joy in the midst of chaos. That ought to set some of you free, because some of us were so perfectionists, we think we can't have joy unless everything's perfect. You'll get it in heaven. It's coming one day. But we can have joy now in the midst of the weird stuff that's going on. But then he goes on to say that we give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. I want to read just a couple of, of, of things here that God gave me this morning. The church today does not know what it means to love God, nor what evil means so that it can hate it. This causes a cascading effect that closes the door to God preserving and protecting us from evil. We also miss the light and the joy because our paths do not take us there. Because I'm not walking right, God can put the, the, the light here, but I'm way over here wandering around in darkness someplace. We dealt with that with dealing with the omnipresence of God last week. Finally, we have no idea of the concept of holiness, much less God's holiness. We no longer. You, you see, there's a reason why Jesus, when he was talking with the woman at the well, he says, you don't know what you worship. How I many know that wasn't a slam? That was just truth. And for most of the church today, you do not know what you worship. You don't know who you worship because you've not been told who he is. Because if you extract the holiness from God, you are no longer dealing with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're dealing with Zeus. You're dealing with Jupiter. You're dealing with Mithra. You're dealing with some pagan God because those pagan gods, I mean, you can't even have a good-looking wife that Zeus doesn't come down and try to seduce her and take her away. That's what the Greeks believed. You couldn't trust their gods. They'd get bored and cause a war just because they're bored. And none of their gods were holy. None of them were holy. But the God of the Bible is holy. I believe it's time, guys, that all this changes because God is preparing us for the days ahead. Therefore, I've got to love God. I've got to hate evil. And as I do, I'm going to begin to see him protect me. I'm going to get joy in the midst of the situation. I think you can go through tribulation and still have joy. Come on now. Why? Because he has already overcome the world. And I'm in him. That I can gain insight and revelation in the midst of the devil trying to kill me that I'll find that he can't touch me, and then God teaches me something that is life-changing and could be world-changing in the midst of that. And how many know with what it looks like is coming on the earth? We got to have some of that. And it's all wrapped up in the holiness of God. Let's go to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11. How many know you want to see the glory of God and some different things? Go back and find out how Moses did it. I can identify with Moses. You know, one time Moses was full of, so full of himself. He said, I'm going to go up and I'm going to kill every Egyptian and I'm going, to, I'm going to free this stuff of myself. And then God had to put him on the backside of the desert for a while. You see, Moses thought he started out being really somebody found out he was a nobody, and then came to the revelation what God can do with a nobody. There I am. There you are. Let's see what Moses said here. Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Now, this is going to be important as we, we get into this. Who is like you among the gods? Who is like thee glorious in what? Holiness. Glorious in holiness. May I purport to you that you don't understand the glory of God until you understand the holiness of God. Yeah. Then he goes on to say, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Now in the Hebrew, this word for glorious is adar, which means to be great, to be majestic, to be noble, to make glorious. And so there's the, when we understand the holiness of God, it adds the nobility to God that should be there. And let me tell you something, the charismatic, the Baptist, the Protestant church, the Catholic church is still playing with Mithra. 
the Protestant church, for the most part, are trying to define the God of the Bible by Mithra because we have not protested enough. We, we need to realize that. We're, we're still trying to play with the, with the whore of Babylon, and we're just trying to get it sanctified enough that maybe God can tolerate it. You've got you to go back to God's Word. But when we understand the holiness of God, God becomes majestic. And see, there's going to be a pattern here that we're going to see. Only when he comes majestic can you praise him. And only when, he, when we understand, the, the understanding the holiness of God is the only true way of getting to the wonders of God. It's in sequence here. Now, holiness in the Hebrew is kodesh. I love this. It means to be a partness. God is completely sanctified. He's completely set apart from anything of this world. Sacredness, separateness. I remember uh, listening to Dr. Scroll teach on the holiness of God, and he said when you, when you look at uh, Kadosh and Kadesh, he said what you, what you get is, is an understanding of completely different. The, the absolute other. Well, what, is this under, what, what, what do we understand by this? Who is like you among the gods because you're so other than anything in the pagan world? The moment you start trying to define God using the pagan concepts of the gods from Greece, the Greco-Roman mindset, or any other pagan religion, you stop defining God. You stop defining him. And yet, over and over again, especially the Gentile church, after we begin to, to be disenfranchised from our Hebraic heritage and begin to look bad toward the Old Testament, we begin defining God by Greek mythology and Greek philosophy, and we started defining him by attributes that we liked out of Apollos, out of we liked about Mithra and all this. You've got to scrap all that because God is holy. He's the absolute other. If the Greeks or the Romans ever understood who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was, they would know that they did not know God at all, and they would have scrapped all that in a heartbeat. He is the absolute other. That's powerful. That's why over and over again, who is like unto the Almighty? You are exalted far above all, all these pagan gods. They ain't got nothing on you, Almighty God. They can't, even, they can't even contend with you or begin to understand who you are. That's wrapped up in the holiness of God. And the moment I realize how other God is and the only way to understand him is by this written word and the power of the Holy Spirit making it come alive to me. The moment I do that, God becomes majestic. And see, if God becomes majestic, you start getting some awesomeness because that, that, that fear there, that fearful means awesome. You become awesome in praises when you understand the one that you're serving. God is so awesome, God is so powerful that if his balancing mercy and justice would allow, the rebellion of Lucifer would have lasted less than one millisecond. God had something else. And that, that's one of the things Mary and I have been kind of discussing this whole thing. Lucifer fell before God made man. Lucifer wanted to be like the Most High and he fell over it. Then God turns around and makes man in his image. God's up to something. What is it? I don't know. He is so other that unless he reveals it, I can't figure it out. But you know what? I can enjoy the ride. That one day, those created in the image of what Lucifer attained to, will, wanted to attain, will judge him. Defeated him. Received the grace of God. Embraced the ways of God when everything in this world is just the opposite of the great other. 
and became victorious in this God of the Bible. And then the Apostle Paul says, we'll judge angels. God's up to something. I just wanted to throw that just to make you think because when we praise, we think, you know, God blessed me today. God got me through a hard thing today. That's why I can praise him. No, when the praise really gets on you bad is when he gives you a glimpse of who he is. Because who he is transcends anything you could ever go through. And when you see who he is and you give him the reverence because he becomes glorious and he becomes awesome, those are the doorways that lead to the wonders of God. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Moses couldn't go down to Egypt until he met the holiness of God at the burning bush. And God says, not only is this burning bush holy, but son, you're standing on holy ground. You better get your shoes off. He encountered the holiness of God. And then when he looked at what Egypt had, he said, Pfft. The more he understood the holiness of God, he so feared God that I tell you what, reverence God, that God said, just take, your, just take a stick and go down to Egypt and get, and get my people out of the mightiest nation on the planet that has the greatest army, that has the greatest technology. I want you to take a stick and go down there and get my people. Take a stick. I'd say, Lord, give me two or three Terminators. We'll go down there and we'll fix some stuff up. You know, gives me a stick. Why? Because stick plus almighty God can tear down a nation. And because he embraced the holiness, this is what Moses is sharing here, because I saw his holiness and it caused within me the reverential praise that is due him. It opened the door so that I could do his wonders in the earth. And church, in the last days, Satan has worked so hard to keep you from understanding the holiness of God because he, he, he realizes if you ever see his holiness, you're going to start praising the way that you need to, and then the wonders are going to be loosed in the earth. Now, here's our conundrum. We have a lot of church services. Holiness cannot be found. So where are the wonders coming from? They don't produce holiness. They can produce big churches, big buildings, big offerings. But do they produce holiness? Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man can see the Lord. And I think that's on two levels. Not only are you not going to see him in the afterlife, you're not going to be able to see his wonders or anything about him here without holiness. And the only way that you can have holiness is you've got to be touched by the Holy One. Hmm. That word fearful or awesome in praise is Yahweh, which means to, to fear, to revere, to be afraid, to be in awe of, to reverence, to honor, and to respect. Why is there not more fear of the Lord today? Oh, the grace, I can get away with anything. You've never touched God's holiness. If you understood that, you wouldn't get away with that. You would understand that that don't work. Mm. Now, I've already thrown out the 800-pound gorilla. A lot, I think, of what's being done in a lot of charismatic churches today, people are talking about miracles. And I don't, I don't care if it's on a program run by somebody Jewish or somebody Gentile. If... God is not reverenced and holy. Not everything supernatural is of God. And I think we see such a blending against those with discernment confused. I don't feel God that, but yet they're producing signs and wonders. We forget God said that I'll allow false prophets to come up among you and they will do false signs and wonders so that I can see if you love me or not. That if you're going to run after the flash in the pan or are you going to stay with the God of holiness? You see, I want the real signs and wonders. I want the devil chasing, sin killing. 
I, I, I want the, the, the arms to begin growing out that weren't there. That produces real revival. Real revival is when sinners come into the hands of a powerful living God and he produces a life-altering event that from that day forth they're never the same again. The world don't mean that much anymore. That they begin walking in holiness and even the religious people around them go crazy at what they're doing because it reveals that all their religiosity is nothing before the Lord. And some of us that have gotten a glimpse of, of God's holiness and we wonder why some Christians that are mad at us is because the religious spirits within them were getting shown up by what's in you. And instead of repenting, they try to drown out that which is true. How many have had believers get madder at you than a sinner? Hey, they had a spirit other than the Holy Spirit creeped into life because they got religious about things. And a religious spirit, will, even when it gets caught up in Hebraic heritage, it will always be about the letter of the law and not the spirit of it. Yeah. One of the things we also need to realize is that the primary attribute, we've been talking about the attributes of God. Now, how many know God's love? Aren't you glad? God's love? God's mercy? But all those other attributes are trumped by one attribute. He is holy. Everything else, every other attribute of God must bow its knee to his holiness. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. There's so much in verses 1 through 5, I could do an entire series just about what's here. Are you having fun this morning yet? Oh, I'm having, I'm having fun. I love the presence of God. I love it when the Word of God comes alive. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth, the whole earth, is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woohoo, we're having church. I can feel the Holy Ghost. No. He said, Woe is me! There, there, there is, let, me, let me finish this because there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle I want to pick up here. And I drive myself crazy when I edit because I read, a ver I read half a verse and, and then a lecture for 10 minutes and, and I'm sitting there, edit, edit, edit. I'm going to bypass that. Let's just stick with this and let me, let me go back. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, there's a lot that we can pick apart here. Number one, God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His train filled the temple. What that means, if you, if you understand kingship, now in America we don't really understand what that means, but even in Europe when you look, and you know some kings, they're, I mean some of them, they're, their train doesn't even make a mini skirt, it just kind of stops right here, and some of them go on down to the floor, and some of them you go back into the old, old movies, you know where they kinda, this kind of goes on, there's, there's two little guys carrying it behind them. The longer the train, the train represented the extent of the kingdom that that king had. And some of them had itty bitty kingdoms, and so they had a miniskirt. Some of them it reached the floor, some of them it just went on forever. Now, how many know the temple of God in heaven is a big temple? You might even be able to put planet Earth right in the middle of it and still have rattling room, okay? And yet, his train filled the temple. There was not a corner, there was not a place to set your foot in that entire temple that God's train did not 
exist in because he is Melech Olam. He is the king of the universe. He is the master of the universe. He is the creator of all that is or all that will ever be. And because he created it, he is king over it. Nothing or no one could ever hope to attain that. Because who could ever unseat the God who creates? Let me tell you something. The little God of this world who perverts cannot overcome the God who creates. No more than an escort could take on the Ford Corporation. Come on. Just think about that. His train filled the temple. And then you have these seraphim. Wild-looking critters. Six sets of wings. But I, I think one of the things that, that so really affected me as I was reading this is it said, and as they spoke, the posts of the doors going into the temple of God would begin to sway at just the awesome power that was released in their voices. So these are not little peewee Hermans floating around the throne of God. These are awesome, powerful creatures that literally affect the very throne room of God, the very temple of God, that when they speak, holy, the temple of God begins to sway at the power that is released as they're just speaking back and forth to one another. And beings of this awesome power are speaking it to each other, but they're not paying attention to each other. They're paying attention to him who sits on the throne. Because their awesome power, from our perspective, is nothing compared to his. <laughs> That's why I wanted to sing that song, You Are God Alone, this morning. You are unshakable. You are unchangeable. You are unstoppable. That's who we serve. And his train fills the temple. Lucifer, if he has a train, he's still trying to get it past the back of his shoulders. But this God, train fills the temple, and beings of this awesome power, all they can talk about is how holy, how other. Now, dude, they got six wings. They fly with two. They cover up their feet with two. They cover up their eyes with two because they can't even hardly stand to look at his awesomeness. How many know that is really other? <laughs> and yet all they can talk about is the absolute otherness of God. Guys, we don't have a glimpse of who he is. And what's interesting is they don't say that God or Yahweh is holy. They say that he is kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. For those of us who don't understand Hebrew, that is brought to the superlative, to the absolute. Nowhere in the word will you ever find that God is mercy, 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 or that God is love, love, love. The absolute characteristic of God that dominates all the other ones is that he is holy, he is holy, he is holy, and everything else must bow its knee, even his other characteristics must bow their knee to his holiness. And if God's justice and God's mercy must bow their knee to his holiness, who do we think we are not to? Let me tell you something, when that dude, when they were trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant back in and it was on the cart, I mean, he tried to do the right thing. The problem is that the holiness of God was contained in that Ark. Sin, when it comes in contact with holiness, dies and there's no way about it. Because it is so other. That's the God that we have to do with. Guys, God's holiness is greater than any other attribute. It trumps his love. It trumps his mercy. It trumps his grace. Only when we understand his holiness does the cross make sense. 
God could not say, it's all right, I know you were tempted. Now, Lucifer wasn't tempted, he's got his comeuppance, and you were, it's okay. God's holiness would not allow him to do that. God's holiness demanded that in one specific singular point in time and space, that the mercy of God, the judgment of God, the wrath of God, the grace of God had to co converge on one point on the cross and the only one who could take it was God himself. And when you understand that, that it was because of his holiness, that's why there is no other way that men might be saved than to accept the price that God paid because only God himself could do it. When we try to water things down, well, it's okay. You know, there are many roads to heaven. No, there are many roads to hell. There are many, many roads to hell. He's not mad he had to take his wife to work. <laughs> he said, Mike gets to preach you good. They go out the door. No, he, he's probably walking out and saying, man, this is so good. I can't wait to get the DVD. Um, God's holiness demanded the cross. And if there is another way, Jesus forever settles that. If there is another way, let's do it, Dad. And he had to say, not my will, but thine be done. Why? Because in the garden, he began to take on our will. The sins of the whole world was placed upon the Lamb of God because the holiness of God demanded it. And then we think that when we come to this God that paid such a price to meet the demands of his holiness that I can just walk with him however I want. You still ain't met God. You, you've not been taught who God is. And then this God from heaven says, be holy as I am holy. That's a good place to go, dude. <laughs> to be holy as he is holy, why? Because the holy one paid for my sins and then he resurrected from the, de from the dead three days later, victorious over death, hell, and the grave and then he put his spirit within me so that he could be holy in me. And yet I play with the trinkets of the world and get so caught up with little fancy sparklies because I've never been told who God is. An atomic bomb in its brilliance can't compare to one second of a glimpse of God. You could take all the nuclear weapons this planet has to, to offer, set them in the palm of his hand, and ignite all of them, and it would be nothing in his hand. That's the God that we serve. That's why the Bible says, is there anything too hard for God to do? No. With men, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. <sighs> Got one more. Let's go to Exodus 28. You know how God tells the end from the beginning... Exodus 28 can teach you how to get through the tribulation period. Well, Brother Mike, I'm not going to be there. I'm a first loader. <laughs> I just want to be ready. There's only one load going. And the more you actually discover from the Bible, that load's toward the almost absolute end of the tribulation period. We escape it by about 10 days if you understand the feast. There's 10 days of awe between the Feast of Trumpets, the last trump, and the Armageddon. 10 days of the world saying, tick tock, you got 10 days to repent. I brought my crowd out of here because I'm getting ready to pour hell on you. That's what the 10 days of awe teach us. So if the Lord so supposes that we need to go through it, how about just getting ready? How many know your foodstuffs won't make sure that you're ready? 
I like having food. I do. You can tell. I like having food. But we also forget that on the books right now in America that if the president ever declares a state of emergency, if you have more than seven days worth of food, you're breaking the law, and all of it but seven days can be seized. Well, there went your five years of 30-year storage food if they find out about it. You see, the food isn't what's going to get you through. What's going to get you through is that you can have a pot of oil that just keeps running oil, that you have bread that can keep multiplying, you have fish that can keep multiplying because you serve the God that's this kind of God. But how do we step into those wonders? Now, this is talking about the mitre that was placed upon Aaron's head. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold. Gold represents holiness. What's so interesting when you, well, one of these days I'm going to get, I want to, I want to teach on, on, on the tabernacle. Because even the throne of God was wood which represents flesh, carnality, covered in gold. The very mercy seat of God is made up of that. So out of gold, out of holiness, and engrave upon it like the engraving of, uh, 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 engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. So it's going to be made out of something that represents holiness, and it's going to declare holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forehead of the mitre it shall be, and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead. Right here, whenever, whenever he got on his, his high priestly garments, right here across his forehead it said holiness unto the Lord. It's talking about a mindset. And how many know that we have a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, and we see representations of that priesthood even in the Aaronic priesthood of things that we can learn? And you say, what, what has that got to do with making it through the tribulation period? Uh, I mean, I, I got, now, is it, now, Brother Lake, is it 24 karat gold, 14 karat gold? Is it because I, I want to get this thing right? You got to wrap your mind with holiness. It's talking about a mindset. Now I have heard Christians talk forever about what is the mark of the beast because you know if you get that mark, now neighbor, you can get that mark. They could put that tattoo on your forehead. You're lost forever. Now you may just wake up one day and there it is. There, that's it. You know, is it a barcode? Is it an RFID chip? What is it? So that I can avoid it. Well, how many know that there's not only a mark of the beast, but there's a mark of God in the book of Revelation? Revelation 7 and 3, I want you to see this in your own Bible. Before the prophecy starts hitting the fan, God's got to make sure that something is done to his people so that the comeuppance on the world don't land on his people. How many know we've been delivered from the wrath to come? You can be in Egypt while the wrath is being poured out upon Pharaoh, and God's going to give you a Goshen. And the only way to get in the Goshen that is coming is that you have got to have a mark. And look, verse 3, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their what? Foreheads. We've been looking for a tattoo. We've been looking for a barcode, and we're not being Hebraic enough. So you see, there, there's a time coming that with, and how many have, can, you can kind of watch the news and see this, that there's beginning to be less and less and less what I call gray. Even most of the church is just jumping off on the wrong side of the cliff. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. We, we have some teaching so hard on grace that Lucifer gets redeemed in the end. And demons get redeemed in the end. Now forget what the word says that there's a lake of fire. That's this metaphorical of this of just the pain that they realized that they had done wrong to God. No, no. It's a real lake, real fire, really burden, forever, really. But there 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 is a separation. And there's a great falling away in the church today. We're falling away from the mind of Christ. 
We're falling away from the holiness of God. We're falling away from the ways of God. We're getting all enamored in the things of man. And all of that, whether you're Islamic, you're Catholic, you're Protestant, or no matter what you are, it's going to pull together into one mindset that once that cast is set, you're unredeemable. On the other hand, when God is working with his people that return to the ways, statutes, and commandments of God because of what Yeshua, Jesus, has done for us, God begins to establish holiness within his people, and that holiness is going to be so contrasted to what's in the world that it, the, the absolute epitome of darkness, the absolute epitome of holiness, and it's going to become set in stone. And what falls on you, the protection of God or the wrath of God, depends upon what's written right here. And there are a lot of saints today that are sitting in churches that holiness unto the Lord is not written, but Ichabod is. Or how about this one? I never knew you. I never knew you, and you never knew me. You were preached another Jesus. Because the moment you separate Jesus from Moses, you're preaching another Jesus. They are inseparable. That's why in the book of Revelation, they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. They're inseparable. That's the mindset that we've got. To, that's why a proper balanced understanding of our Hebraic heritage is so important. We've got to take the commandments of God, the power of the cross, the working of the blood of Jesus, and understanding the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's all got to be wrapped together, and it becomes holiness, understanding the holiness of God, which causes us to really reverence God, that the praise is true, that opens up the wonders of God. Because we're going to need wonders in the days ahead. I mean, prophets, modern day prophets have been talking about it, that when armies come, they divide and they go around and don't even know that they were divided as they walked around encampments of the saints. The jet planes begin to swoop down to Bominary and find themselves somewhere else. Or a sandstorm or a dust storm raises up and chokes out their engines and they can't get there. Or that the little bit that you do have when you walk with God becomes much. What happens if you can't call a doctor? You can still call upon the great healer. Come on now. I'm talking about walking in levels of supernatural that we have not really ever experienced. But we're going to. I believe in the days that we're living, we are going to. And the only way to get there is for God to reveal his holiness to us. Because only when I see he who is holy can I become holy. We have a lot of people striving to be a mithric Jesus. Because that's the Jesus that they have been preached. They've not even been taught a Jewish Jesus. Well, Brother Mike, I know that there's a lot of prophetic words and there's a lot of things, and such prophetic, 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 prophetic. Apollos had prophets. That was the, the oracles of Delphi were prophets of Apollos, or prophetesses of Apollos. One of them, oh, what is her name? It just, it just shot out my head. The one that's painted on, on, in, in the Vatican. Oh, Tom Horn, where are you when I need something that you put out? I'll look it up. It's in some of the other stuff that I've taught. But they actually have her painted a pagan prophetess of Apollos is painted along with the Old Testament prophets in the Vatican. And if you have a $1 bill in your wallet where it says announcing the new world order, that is extrapolated out of her prophecies of the return of Apollos. We will call him Antichrist. 
and announcing his return and establishing of a kingdom. You see, the old gods are getting ready to come back with a vengeance. They're getting ready to come back. Because there's going to be a confrontation of the old gods along with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the same way that there was a confrontation of the gods of Egypt to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That God himself rained down fire and judged and brought every one of those gods underfoot with every plague that he poured out. Now, the Kuman Sibyl. It's her prophecy of the return of Apollos that's attached to the coming New World Order. All the old gods are getting ready to come back. And I thought it was interesting, it was out of the mouth of Glenn Beck. Bless his little heart. He went to Israel and he experienced God there. He also experienced what darkness was at Auschwitz. It's still there. And, and if you look at his pictures when he was going through it, you could see it wearing on his soul, the darkness that was released there. But he looked right into the camera one day, and he said, he said, now, you know, we, we talk about Jesus, and I love Jesus. But he said, when I was over in Israel, I felt the presence of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as only it could be revealed in Israel. And then he looked in the camera and said, and Daddy is coming home. We're getting ready to see Old Testament, guys. We're getting ready. That's why we got to have the path right. That's the whole purpose of biblical life is to get you ready so that you're not walking with Mithra, but that you're walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to have his wonders th flow through me, not targeted at me. Come on. It's understanding who he is. And there is an epic battle that, that happens in the book of Revelation that all the old gods that so controlled men that were the watchers that produced the Nephilim that became all the, the gods. And I can get into a whole series about what all that's about. They're getting, because some of them are bound up. They've been bound up for quite a while. You see them beginning to be released in the book of Revelation. For a one-time all assault, God against the fallen ones. And man's in the middle. And it literally comes down to who do you serve? Because you think like the one you serve. It doesn't matter what you call him. It matters what you think and what you do. Because out of your mindset. You see the reason the mark is on your hand, your right hand, because predominantly everybody is right-handed. It's because it's by what you think and what you do. What you think and what you do. The, the strength of the right arm, it's by what you do with your strength that your mindset is revealed. But those who have holiness unto the Lord, it's not just the right hand. It's their hands that we can lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. That we can stretch forth our hands in prayer and God will do wonders. The mindset. Guys, begin asking God. God, put some light in my path. Show me your holiness. Show me, help me understand your holiness. Because I could, I could, talk from now till the cows come home about the holiness of God and you may not fully be able to grasp it but if he just gives you a glimpse a little dab will do you just a glimpse then you will be like the seraphim that you begin crying out holy after you get done and saying woe is me for I am undone and Jesus will get rid of your undone dough he'll the good dose of the blood and the fire of the Holy Ghost to burn out the chaff, to burn out the worldliness. And then from your lips will begin crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. 
Antichrist, who are you compared to Almighty God? Lucifer, who are you? Who are you? We find part of his end in Isaiah where it talks about his fall. It says, one day we will gather around him and say, is this what destroyed and deceived nations? Is this? Now right now he looks pretty big, but it's because we've not seen that. But once you see God, he gets real small. Our big problem today is our God is too small and our devil is too big. That's a whole, that's a sermon right there. Your God is too small and your devil is too big, but if you would see who God is, it's a small thing for God to take care of him. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. Father, our desire is to have light, understanding. Father, give us a glimpse of your holiness. Father, begin opening up our hearts to understanding your holiness, that proper reverence will take hold in our being. Father, we cry out this morning, Father, open our eyes that we may see your holiness. Father, so unlike anything that we could ever imagine, because you are the absolute other. But by your spirit and by your word, you can reveal. Now, Father, we bind up the devil. We bind up false manifestations or false instruction of the enemy. Father, we, we repent of all the concepts that we accepted of you, that we were taught of you, that were extrapolated from pagan gods, and we renounce those things. And, Father, we only embrace your word. And, Father, begin showing us, Father, as, as we go through the next few weeks, Father, just begin showing us your holiness, Father, in your word, Father, in our dreams, Father, as we pray, as we seek your face in situations, begin to show us your holiness that we could really understand who you are. Now, Father, there's two or more of us are gathered today, and we're gathered in the name of Messiah. Father, your word promises us that when we come into agreement as touching anything, that it would be done. Father, we come into agreement this morning that you are going to show us a glimpse of your holiness, and it is going to change us forever. Because the little games that we have been playing, that we've been calling church, we have been calling life, will be revealed as nothing and we can finally put away childish things when we see your holiness. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.